Welcome to the Systematic Understanding of Everything, an Exalted podcast. This show is a collaborative effort between members of the Story Told, Bonus Experience, and Mage the Podcast. We're going to break down the basics of Exalted from its rules to its setting. Hello, welcome back. This is episode two. I'm Monica. Exalted 3rd Edition Supplement Developer and Lead Mechanical Developer for Exalted Essence. And I'm Chaz, Exalted Writer and Fan. This is Episode 2, Trackless Region Navigation, in which we offer a broad overview of creation, the world of Exalted, and the realms beyond, including the history and cosmology of Exalted's unique setting. So we may as well just start at the literal beginning, um, and let's talk about how creation formed. Yeah, creation was formed as a stable disk on the wild by the primordials. So that term has yet to be used in third edition, with the core book preferring to call them the creators of the world or the enemies of the gods. In some of the later stuff that we're working on, they are also referred to sometimes as titans. But the short version of what these things are is that they are impossibly powerful ur beings that uh, shaped this world out of primal chaotic soup. And that is where it gets its incredibly original name, creation. (laughs) It's also important to note that, um, as Chaz said, creation is not a planet. It's a disk. It's a flat plane. And while it definitely has seasons, and it's got a sun, and it's got a moon, it's got a sky, and all that stuff, all those things that might feel familiar to us as people who live in the real world, it's not Earth. It's its own fantasy world. And if you ask how those things work, it's magic. The gods do it. (laughs) More on that later. (laughs) (laughs) Since we've just established in the beginning, we should probably move on to, like, how creation came to be. Yeah, across the history of creation, uh, there's kind of a long history of it pushing outwards and kind of growing horizontally in every direction out into the wild. But the edges of creation get slowly eroded away into the chaos of the wild. And that, that sometimes leaves soft spots around creation. Since we talk about it as a disc on a sea of chaos, sometimes the water table's a little higher and things get a little weird. Yeah, it's like, think of it like the tide. As events change the shape of the world, the tide of the wild ebbs and flows. And very much like a real tide, it leaves behind tide pools and sometimes weird spots too. It's one of the things I like about it a lot. It definitely offers a lot of unique opportunities, especially at Creation's Edges, to put whatever you want out there that fits within the setting. So with Creation having such a long history, how do we uh, approach Creation's eras? History is, there's broken up into a ton of different like little flavorful eras there's a lot of them i used to know all of them but then they changed them (laughs) between editions and now i no longer do (laughs) i think there's a lot more of them. oh yeah there's way more like they they like the second edition's dreams of the first age had a whole bunch of like more smaller but uh fewer but more defined time periods um in fact i like ran a couple historical games set in them and third edition leaned more towards we're just gonna name when this weird thing happened as opposed to like spending a paragraph talking about it and a bunch of them are in arms of the chosen because like a bunch of historical artifacts are from these cool periods of history Yeah, that was one of the things that I really liked about that book, all of the little bits of history that got scattered through just by naming eras and talking about where these historical artifacts originated from. But kind of taking a step back to the 5,000 foot view, there's really uh, four important periods, I think, in understanding the, the history of Exalted that define how creation has come to be what it is today and, and kind of some seminal events along the way that make creation and the setting what it is. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree with that. We can, we can kind of break down all of the game's history into these four discrete chunks. And so where does that begin? It begins with the Divine Rebellion, which is the inciting incident, really, for the whole game. We mentioned last episode about the Exalted being made as weapons, and this is the war they were built for. The gods rebelled against their creators, the aforementioned primordials or titans or enemies of the gods. This is thousands of years in the past and shrouded in mystery. Pretty much all we know about it is that like the gods rebelled against the, the people that made the world, they made the Exalted to be their weapons, and they they won. That's That's important. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they won. Creation was changed ever for it. Yep. 
and divine victory led to the first age. The gods retreated to Yushan, or heaven, and left the exalted, particularly the solar exalted, to rule creation. It started as a golden age for all creation, and the lasting effects of the age are still visible throughout the world in the forms of impossible constru construction, like Kiraskoro, the city of glass, uh, artifacts of first age artifacts, and the remnants of vast sorceress workings, like the River of Tears, which flows out of the sea instead of into it. And the rule of the Solars was ultimately overthrown with a great tragic event called the Usurpation, which ended the First Age proper. Also, the First Age is one of the things that's broken down into all these cool, weird little eras that uh, artifacts and stuff are often from. We don't need to list all of them. That's not important right now. <laughs> The details of the first age are only important as they are relevant to your game. It is yep. a time thousands of years before, or, well, more than a thousand years before the game's primary setting. And so having a lot of detail for it doesn't really impact the day-to-day -day happenings and origin for your characters. It does, however, make, add one of the layers of flavor that I really love about uh, creation as a setting in that the current time period, which we'll get to, is, is really crouching in what is like a post 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 apocalypse like the ruins of an of many ages before are beneath your feet and i love that definitely yeah so post usurpation then the dragon blooded take over do you want to talk about the shogunate a little bit sure uh the shogunate period was kind of the dragon blooded attempt to continue the grand society of the first age albeit diminished they kind of fought amongst themselves in the ruins wrought by the usurpation, and eventually, between infighting, a vast uh, plague called the Contagion, and an invasion from the wild by the Fair Folk, the Balorian Crusade, wiped out 90% of creation's population, and the wild swept towards creation's center, setting up the dragon-blooded to be in a, a terribly desperate situation, and one of their number made her way into one of those uh, workings of First Age Sorcery and Artifice, the Realm Defense Grid, and used it to sweep the Fair Folk from creation in storms of fire, and then used its power to seize control of the center of creation for herself, uh, becoming the Scarlet Empress. Yeah, it turns out if you take over the world-saving superweapon and stop the world itself from getting destroyed, you get to then say, I'm in charge now. <laughs> So the Scarlet Empress then founded the Scarlet Dynasty, which is the important fixture of power in the current timeline. And her reign actually lasts for quite some time before we even get to the opening of the game. The, the dynasty is built up. She does a good job of stabilizing the world, bringing order back to it, restoring creation, as we talked about before, like the, the tide ebbing and flowing. So the, the wild had rushed in, it starts to rebuild. We get a whole lot of new places. Is this what, like 700 years, I think? Uh, yeah, 760-something, I something. believe. Yeah. You know, very much like the Avatar when the world needed her most, she vanished. Uh, <laughs> so she, at the current point where the game begins, the Scarlet Empress has disappeared. And because she was such a central fixture of power, this has caused a power vacuum and the subsequent political problems that comes with the one person who was holding everything up no longer being there. The... Scarlet Dynasty is on the verge of collapse, and the Solar Exalted have returned. This is the starting point of the game, and if you are a fan returning for 3rd edition, or maybe even for Essence, you'll actually find that the, that's the same as the meta plot for the starting point of the Age of Sol Sorrows that's always been the case. 3rd edition didn't change that, and Essence isn't going to change it either. Yeah, Scarlet Empress disappeared five years ago, the Solar Exalted are returning, the Dynasty is on the verge of collapse, and all those big beats remain the same. And that the game assumes that you're going to play an Age of Sorrows game, crouching in the ruins of these grand ages that came before you. Maybe exalts can have previous lives. Maybe you remember some of these things. Like, all the past exists to detail things about your character. With the reincarnation of the Exalted, like Monica said, you can have memories of those past ages and kind of lay down connections or, or hints to connections with other Exalted. Uh, but the the focus, especially in third edition, is really on the modern era and how things are now, rather than drawing a continuous through line back to the first age. I think most of those lines uh, get blurred by the uh, the contagion and the Valorian Crusade, if not uh, more recently. 
So now that we've talked a lot about creation's formation and history and like the periods of time that could be relevant to your game and the place in which the game starts, let's talk about what inhabits creation. And let's start with like what sort of creatures can we expect to see? What sort of natural stuff can we expect to see? Since it's sort of, it's familiar enough to a, a person that it's not going to totally alien wor world, but what other stuff exists? Well, creation is big enough that in it includes uh, all animals from our world, including extinct creatures. There are dinosaurs, lots of them, <laughs> uh, as well as other extinct animals. Um, I remember during the uh, third edition core Kickstarter, one of the uh, bonus options was to be able to pick an extinct animal and the, the developers and writers would write it up and add it to the book. So there's a lot of them. Wh how did I miss that? Oh, yeah, no, Terry, there's like there's like five dinosaurs in the in the no, core book. But I'm saying there was an indeterminate time in the past where if I threw money at Onyx Path, I could have been like, I contratherium, a rhinoceros that could look through a second story window. Shove it in your game. Deal. I'm out. And then that would be, damn it. Okay. <laughs> yes, that, that was a possibility. I missed the damn window. I could have re requested one of the useless animals that we're not quite sure what they do, like Edicarian fauna and so on. It's the thing that just you, looks like a giant yeah. leaf. You, you could have done that in the uh, Lunar's Kickstarter as well. And ah, made me yeah. it. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> now, the ne next effing Kickstarter for Exalted, I either need to be on the cover of Sidereals or I need to bring back something large and useless that biology doesn't fully understand. I've got my 2021 goals. I don't know if there's going to be a, a creature option for Exigence, but it is the next one, so keep your eyes out. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> or, or like an extinct like type of amoeba or something like that. Yep, they exist. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Creation also has a number of unique animals, like the carrion-eating riton, that is uh, like a, a cross between a, a bat, raven, and lizard. The yedim, who are giant beasts of burden. And the river dragon, which really more and more seems like it's probably just a Spinosaurus, now that uh, new discoveries about Spinosaurus have, have revealed their giant tail. The river dragon is basically just like a gonzo crocodile fish. <laughs> like, it's just like a really big freshwater cryptid except it's not a cryptid people know it exists so yeah it could be a spinosaurus it could also be just like a, a combo animal which like avatar the last airbender combo animals totally exist here too so you can have like badger moles and that's the only one i could remember the name of off the top of my head but like the simhata which are a thing you can take as a familiar which are like creatures specifically created to be mounts for the exalted are literally lion horses yeah they're pretty yeah, cool they're very cool Big, buff, dangerous mounts that have like a lion face, but hoofs. They're great. I love them. So besides these wonderful, wild and bizarre natural animals, there are also supernatural creatures. So let's let's run down um, some of these supernatural things that someone might encounter. Well, in, I guess, alphabetical order seems to be how, how we've organized so that, these. That appears to, well, you put ghosts before fair folk. Oh, that's true. Yeah, uh, close enough, close enough. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Beast folk are, are mortals uh, with varying animal characteristics from the, the mild. Uh, for example, you may have uh, cat folk that just have like cat-like eyes and tails, all the way to the fairly extreme, like shark folk who are fully aquatic and don't come out onto the land. So uh, all of these are still mortals and still considered human and thus still able to exalt, become part of the exalted host, but they have these animal characteristics. So yeah, if you really want to be a snake man, Dawncast, you totally can. There are also elementals, which are all sorts of beings of the, of the five elements. They're spirit-like, but their natural state is being physical and present as opposed to being dematerial. They also typically have like some kind of animal shape, if I recall correctly. Like wood spiders are one of them. Flame ducks. The flame ducks, yes. Uh, what are those vine maw ones in the, yeah, uh, green, the maw. Book? the green, green maw. maws? Yeah. yeah, which are basically Giant just planty jaw creatures. Jaw creatures, yeah. Uh, there's the uh, the bears, the, the, the bear. wind bears. Oh yeah, the wind bears. The, the wind bears. Yeah. Storm serpents who who yes. uh, end up directing lightning strikes. The sky people who live in their cloud cities. There's all kinds of of weird and wacky elemental inhabitants of creation. They do tend to be animalistic, some sort of creature. Uh, then there are ghosts, the, the souls of the dead, that both linger in creation and inhabit the underworld. Uh, I have them helpfully noted on our outline as X people. And Terry has uh, edited our outline to spell fair folk with a PH so that now it is in fact in alphabetical order. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> I helped. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, so yeah, so the, 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 the fair folk, sometimes also called the Raksha, are the beings that live in the wild. They have all sorts of strange taxonomy and classifications, which is a little bit more inside baseball than we're going to get from this episode, but they very much in a similar manner to the the fae of real world myth, eat souls and steal children and make deals and are very dangerous, but pretty. Uh, Then I have a couple other things listed here that I think we should talk about. Dragon Kings for sure. Yeah. Talk about the Dragon Kings. Oh, sure. Dragon Kings are sentient dinosaur people. (laughs) Because creation is so old and the primordials... The makers of the world made so many other things before humans. Dragon kings were one of the like original primal species, and the they were the favored of the unconquered sun before he chose the solars. They are quite literally like dinosaur people or dragon people in a more bestial looking like dragon born from D&D, D&D's most two current iterations way than like a sexy dragon person sort of way. <laughs> they, they definitely look like creatures, more creature, less people. And they had, at least in previous editions, cool mini charms called paths that had like a five dot tier. And then they were sort of vaguely elemental based. And I kind of hope that they appear in a later supplement full of weird alternate things to play. Oh, they could also become basically like mini exalts called uh, Ochilike by letting a god possess them. Yeah, I look forward to seeing the third edition incarnation of the Dragon Kings. Speaking of other weird things that you can play, kind of, the Jadeborn are the fair folk who got trapped inside creation when it was formed and crystallized into a new type of being and were later carved from the earth and still live beneath the earth. They are nominally allies of the realm and have their whole own subterranean civilization that has all of its own problems under the earth. I've always thought they're kind of neat, and uh, we, we got to see a, a look of, at them in the realm. There's a great piece of art with them delivering tribute to the Scarlet Empress. Yeah, I kind of hope we get a book that maybe lets us play them both. They, they seem like they would go together in a, in a future supplement. On the thing, subject of things that are cool and lurk in creation that are not playable, there are creatures called behemoths, which, as you could probably guess from the name, really big. <laughs> creation has kaiju. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, and, and you mentioned earlier that the primordials really spent, uh, spent uh, eons kind of creating and experimenting. And so uh, behemoths can be left over from that. Yes. can be kind of other species that are left over from that. So if you want to add in, say, weird proto-bird people somewhere out there that aren't beast folk but are, are their own unique thing, you could do something like that. There's room for all kind of little weird hidden things in the crazy corners of creation. Yeah, uh, behemoths can both be an ancient beast left behind by the primordials. Some, some just, just, a, just a mountain walking around with thoughts, but they can also be created by the fair folk too. Wild behemoths are certainly a thing that can exist. Let's just springboard from giant monsters to talking about gods. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So uh, regarding the divine presence in creation, how does that work? The, all right. So there's a bureaucracy of gods, very much like straight out of Chinese myth, where all gods have jobs, they have offices. We, we, We touched on Yushan very briefly, and that's heaven but it is also like the the celestial office space (laughs) like that's where all the the gods work so like the god of a river is more like a chinese version where like the god's job is to be in charge of the river and all the river's problems as opposed to like a more greek take on that myth where like the god is the river or embodies it or whatever now a a god may have aspects of the thing that is their purview the thing that they're in charge of because those two things go together but the god of the river is not literally the river yeah I, i think there's there's been kind of a cool thing where gods do take on aspects of the thing that they are part of and then the the worship of that god can be expressed through other aspects like alhat the uh, southern god of war used to be a god of cattle and so has a a bull head and there's a bull motif in his worship so gods kind of keep the trappings of their former offices as they get uh promoted up the celestial ladder so to speak yeah there's now if i recall correctly probably should have read it before i did this there's basically like two bureaucracies one's in heaven that's the celestial one and then there's one on in creation and that's the terrestrial one 
Yeah, the, the celestial bureaucracy is like the central command directly under the Incarna being uh, the gods of, of the sky objects. Uh, we've talked about uh, the unconquered sun, uh, Luna, the, the, the five maidens. They kind of run things. Um, and all of the other gods report up through them through b- various bureaus and departments. But s- many gods are left in creation in the terrestrial uh, bureaucracy where they manage local affairs or a particular type of responsibility in their local area. And they tend to have more independence uh, than the gods up in Yushan and are, are prone to go rogue um, just <laughs> due to the, the vast scale of the heavenly bureaucracy. Uh, you can have entire terrestrial branches that have been forgotten by Yushan. Yeah, somebody forgot to file the paperwork and no one will ever know. <laughs> uh, so you know the, because it's a bureaucracy and like you Chaz mentioned gods can be promoted and given new jobs and then they keep a little bit of the trappings of who they were previously um, so obviously in, in a case where there's like a bureaucratic system and promotions and such there's politics and corruption just like <laughs> as above so below so we can, that seems like a good segue to talking about the politics of the world currently Yeah, uh, we could really do an entire podcast series on all the little political entities in creation, uh, on the politics of the realm itself, but we have limited time, so we'll do the uh, quick version of all of this. At the center of creation is the realm, uh, once ruled by the Scarlet Empress, uh, and now fought over by the dragon-blooded of the Great Houses. It occupies the Blessed Isle, which is the large central island continent uh, of creation. It has a a complex and bureaucratic government that was really created more to keep the reins of power in the Empress's hands while distracting her rivals and keeping them at each other's throats instead of pointing their knives at her. And so, as we mentioned with her disappearance, that system is is teetering out of control and on the, the brink of collapse. Yeah, and all around the Blessed Isle is basically the rest of the world. Um, So it is called the Threshold, which is defined from the perspective of the realm. And it consists of a variety of tributary states, ranging from fairly independent city-states like Chiaroscuro, which manages its own affairs and pays to keep the realm at bay, to others completely ruled by dragon-blooded and their agents. Like, would you say that Chalon or Kalon? Uh, I say Chalon. Chalon, okay, cool. And their agents like Chalan, Numa, or Grey Falls. Uh, the, the commonality of these satrapies is tribute to the realm. But there are also tons of other places in the threshold. That is like the vast majority of the world. You could make up just about any kind of cool thing using Exalted's basic theme- themes and find a place in the threshold to run that game in. Yep. And I think 3rd edition again has, has done a great job of spreading out those possibilities, adding lots more little places, and emphasizing just how big and weird and diverse creation is. So so like Monica said, there's room for whatever little fantasy kingdom, city-state, empire that you would like to to put out there. There's a part of the threshold called the Hundred Kingdoms, where, which is basically the no wrong answers part of the, ro- the world. <laughs> so while Exalted typically does not do like, like a more D&D-esque fantasy with like knights and stuff like that you could totally have a one kingdom in the the hundred kingdoms that was very arthurian themed and it still wouldn't really be out of place yeah definitely and and you can also take those things and flavor them with other aspects of creation to fit them in anywhere else Uh, i had a another i had a player in one of my solar games who very much wanted to play like a, a classic mounted knight and so we we created this little kingdom near Marukan, which are uh, kind of the horse ranching people that are, are like Mongol cowboys. But we, we gave them a more settled society that, that still revered horsemanship, but had kind of this more settled aspect. And so it, 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 he got to be a, a mounted knight, uh, but still very much in the flavor of creation. So given how uh, huge and diverse creation is, why don't we kind of take a tour of the world? Right. Uh, So the world is broken down into five major directions. We have the center. And it's kind of cool for a setting to begin with the center, because it's a flat plane and you can do that. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, Which is held up by the pole of Earth. That pole, which maybe we should have talked first about how creation has five elemental poles. Sort of like a planet has a north and south pole. This big disk is basically affixed to the world by 
elemental poles that are the magic that make it have weather and stuff. Imagine if someone like pinned it down, made that island stay put by putting these like five anchors down. So the one in the middle is the Imperial Mountain, a giant, impossibly big mountain that holds down the center of everything and is right smack dab in the middle of the Blessed Isle. The north uh, is ruled by the elemental pole of air. It's hard scrabble and cold. There's many supernatural threats and young states that live in the ruins of past empires and glacial expanses. Then to the east, you have the elemental pole of wood. No jokes, please. Uh, <laughs> which is where the, uh, the scavenger lands are. This is part of that Hundred Kingdoms I was talking about earlier. It's also home to the city of Nexus, which is a great place to begin a, an, an intro to Exalted Game. It's a, it's a port city, it's cosmopolitan, there's all sorts of stuff going on there. The east is the most populous direction. It's very independent from the realm. There are rivers, there are forests, there are jungles. All kinds of cool stuff. Definitely, it's definitely my favorite direction to, to play in because there's all kinds of stuff there and there's there's basically no wrong answers. Yeah, it's the direction that I have run games set in the most. I don't know if it's my favorite, but, but there's a lot of little places that I love there. The south, it, of course, has the elemental pole of fire. It's a land of wealthy, powerful states, tyrannical rulers, deserts, and volcanoes. And as you travel further south, you kind of get this, this glowing fire in the sky, firestorm effect as you uh, pass into the wild towards the elemental pole of fire. Uh, to the west, you have the elemental pole of water. The land mass out there is mostly islands arranged in archipelagos. It's pretty distant from the rest of creation. Sailing and fishing, obviously, are livelihoods for many people, as it is the water direction. And uh, it's got the call, which is a weird, wild place that is currently being kind of hotly contested between Lunars and Dragonblooded. Yeah, the call is one of the new, totally new uh, segments of Creation's map that uh, comes in 3rd edition and kind of has this neat mini island continent feel out in the west where, like Monica said, you've got this conflict uh, going on. Similarly, in the southeast, there's now the Dreaming Sea, which kind of offers its whole own little mini realm of, of dragon-blooded and independent city-states and uh, lunar powers. Um, all around the sea, plied by fair folk and ships of glass and fire. It's a, a very cool new aspect of the setting introduced in 3rd edition. Yeah, prior to the Dreaming Sea being added, the east was pretty much just the, the only bodies of water were like rivers. And so now that there's this big magical body of water it really adds something new to the east, which was already very cool. Also, the southwest got expanded. It used to just have kind of the jungle realm of Antang, which is, a, I can think, a fan favorite location. But now that coast has kind of been spread down thousands of miles, and you have the Cinder Isles, and uh, again, a whole new area of creation to explore and adventure. So you can really split creation sort of into eight directions, where you also talk about the southwest, the northwest, the northeast, the southeast. Uh, and then so you have north, south, east, west, obviously center, and then these other ones. And that's the, but the southwest was really the one that sort of got the most new love for third edition. So now that we've talked about, we've gone on a worldwide quick tour, our bird's eye view of what creation itself is like. Let's talk about what exists beyond creation. Creation is not the only place exalted games can happen. <laughs> Yeah, some games may never visit these other realms, and that's a small r realm, not the realm. Right. Uh, but, but others are critical for certain character types, like Yushan for the Sidereal Exalted who work there, or the Underworld for Abyssals or Liminals who are explicitly touched by death. So you may or may not visit these places over the course of your game, and whether or not you visit them can be varying degrees of wild and exciting. Some sorcery spells may even allow you to travel to these other places very quickly. So I think probably the first one we should talk about is the wild, which is, you know, the big chaos sea that surrounds reality. It is a realm of infinite and shifting possibility beyond the stabilized borders of creation. Uh, we already talked about how it seeps in wherever the edges of creation get soft. This used to be like the, the place where lunars hung out, but that, that's since kind of been changed a little bit. I think their tattoos still protect them from the warping qualities of the wild, if I recall correctly, right? Yes, it definitely yeah. does. And, and lunars would have no problem going out into the wild 
but their focus has shifted in inward. I think with the expansion of the map that came with 3rd edition, if the Lunars had stayed on the edges, they would have been too far away from everything to matter. <laughs> and so it made more sense to, to turn them inwards and give them that defining conflict with the realm that keeps them relevant in every corner of creation rather than being on the borders looking out, uh, yeah. which, which keeps them away from the exciting adventures that can happen throughout all of creation. Being on the edges has always kind of perennially been a problem for them. So I'm glad that got changed. Yeah, me too. Uh, so then we have Yushan, which we keep bringing up, but that's that's heaven. It is formerly the home of creation's creators. It is the seat of the celestial bureaucracy. It is the home of the gods. Yushan mostly mirrors the shape of the Blessed Isle and is this big divine city. And there are there are portals to Yushan all throughout creation. One, one, it's one of the things that you can access through a spell. There are like silver canals i don't know if that's still gonna stay but there were at least in previous editions and like clouds you can summon to ride on and if you are playing a sidereal you're gonna be spending some time there because you work there <laughs> you're gonna have to check in every so often you gotta you gotta tell your manager that the job is done <laughs> yep yep uh you also have heaven's dragons uh who are the the dragon blooded whose families all live in yushan because there are also mortals there and therefore there are also dragon blooded unless you're a sidereal or one of heaven's dragons visiting yushan is pretty extraordinary and definitely an adventure to write home about yeah uh the the unsurprisingly the heaven is pretty heavily guarded and getting in through one of the gates not so easy <laughs> I don't know how third edition is going to handle that, but previously, if you were like, it was very much a, like, you have to have this much essence to ride. Like you could, any celestial could basically be like, no, I'm suitably powerful. Let me in. And the, the celestial, the, the, the celestial lions, these basically giant gold lions that protect the, the portal would be like, okay, <laughs> you're good. Uh, and if you weren't, they would stop you. Yeah, I, I suspect it will not not be quite that way in yeah, third probably edition, not. but I, I expect the Celestial Lions will still be guarding those gates. I would not expect the Celestial Lions to, to go anywhere, but I don't think it will be a flash your essence at the door and get in <laughs> quite like it was previously. Yeah, it will probably be something less heavy handed than that. <laughs> probably. So in, in the opposite direction. Yeah, you have the underworld, which is metaphysically beneath creation. It is a dark reflection of creation and its past and its past peoples. It is the home of ghosts. It is ruled over by the dual monarchy, who are these uh, weird ghosts who rule the center of the underworld, and the death lords, who are ancient ghost kings that pursue their own agendas, empowered by the ghosts of the primordials themselves. They lord over the Abyssals, and so the Underworld is a common location where an Abyssals game could start, or, or certainly visit. I suspect the Liminals will also have a, a heavy presence in the Underworld. And then the other Exalted are like, more likely to interact with Shadowlands, places where the boundary between creation and the Underworld grow thin, where they overlap and you can pass between them. These are often kind of dark and scary places, touched by death in some way, inhabited by ghosts and offer a lot of interesting kind of blasted domains to set adventures in. I hope that third edition will detail the underworld in a a more interesting way than it has in the past, because it's usually just been like, it's dead, you can't get essence back, it sucks, don't go there. And and now now there's like all these really interesting things, there's all these dark reflections of cities, they got rid of the whole you can't respire essence in the underworld. So I'm looking forward to the underworld becoming a place that I'm interested in visiting in, in, in my games. But speaking of my personal in- interests, we saved my favorite for last. <laughs> which is, of course, Malpheus the Demon City, which is Exalted's Hell. Um, it is the prison realm for what are now called the Yozis, who are what remained of the creators after they got their butts kicked during the Divine Revolution. The former king of gods or primordials or whatever um, as the terms of his surrender was literally turned inside out and all the other er beings jammed into him to make this horrible torturous hell realm that which then got chucked into nowhere and sealed away forever never to be heard from again this 
layered demon city is surrounded by an endless desert, which is another one of the X primordials. It is the place demons are summoned from. The endless desert always takes five days to cross, no matter how fast you are or no matter what sort of travel magic you have. And this will be the home base for the Infernal Exalted when they come out. Infernal games probably will not always take place in Malpheus, but probably will very much sort of like the Sidereals have to go check in in Yushan every so often. Infernals will probably have to do something similar. And it would be pretty, pretty exceptional for non-Infernal characters to be going there. Unless, of course, your character is some sort of Infernalist or occultist who's really interested in doing stuff with demons. And that, I think, would certainly arouse suspicion from their their party members, if not not authorities. <laughs> I think 3rd edition has also suggested that there are other realms like Zenmu, which is a retired version of heaven. There's a pocket dimension inside an artifact, and I think plenty of room to build other spaces like that uh, if you want adventures beyond creation. We didn't talk about Autochthonia at all. Do we want to? Yes. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Terry says yes, very enthusiastically. <laughs> it's like the one setting that also exists in Mage. I'm afraid they're pretty different. Not At least I think they're pretty different. I'm not, not that if... familiar with Autochthonia in Mage. Uh, giant so. machine realm overviewed has been there since creation, kind of. It's your birthday present if you're a good cyborg. Oh, okay. they're, they're basically identical if you squint I, and misunderstand. I mean, words. it's surface level similarity sure i i can see why the person who stole the name for first edition did so one of the primordials who was not an enemy of the gods the autochthon who i think still created the exaltations in third edition i don't think that got changed the you know the exalted took over and he was just sort of like mm, I'm, I'm out i'm out of here and then very much also fucked off to nowhere and a bunch of people went with him and he's made himself into a machine planet and people live in him and that's where alchemicals come from it's one of the places alchemicals come from tiny spoiler i'm excited about that autochthonia uh, has kind of been absent from creation for a long time uh, again in the first age there was travel between the two and then autochthonia fucked off and one of the the very early plots of uh, first edition was to bring autochthonia back and that usually gets relegated to the end of whatever edition it's in. So I'm, I'm hoping we get to see Autochthonia and the, the alchemicals sooner this time round. And we will. Yeah. So, Terry, you've heard us ramble for near on an hour now. What questions does that leave you with about, uh, ex- about the topics we've covered today? So what is Arms of the Chosen? You've mentioned it. It sounds like a book. Oh, yeah. It's the stuff book. It's the artifacts and hearthstones and equipment book it was one of the first supplements to come out for third edition kind of like a player's companion or a yeah got it Uh, yeah definitely more on the the player's side in terms of the arms and equipment uh uh, kind of a a book Uh, question the second so you mentioned this the usurpation happened who who did the usurpin and why i think that might need to be next episode (laughs) okay yeah we'll we'll dive into this in detail when we talk about the solar exalted i think but some but uh, somebody didn't like how something was being done they're like you know what time it is fuck this shit o'clock and then something went down okay yeah so yep. the, the, basically the whole cycle of creation's history is uh uh people get power they abuse it someone else goes it's fuck the shit o'clock then they replace them then they get power then they abuse it then someone else goes it's fuck the shit o'clock <laughs> lather and repeat until the current day Yep, that, that's a good summation. Uh, in this case, the Solars were being bad. The Sidereals were like, fuck this shit, and convinced the Dragon-Blooded to go fuck this shit. Got it. Uh, does everyone turn into a ghost? So some people, like, there's basically a cycle of reincarnation, right? Yes, everyone becomes a ghost, but only people who want to stick around. If you die and you're like, I'm good, you just wash into the cycle of reincarnation and your soul pops back into its next life. And where is Autochthonia? Is it like a giant spaceship on the wild or elsewhere? Uh, it's a giant spaceship elsewhere. <laughs> okay. Malpheus and stuff are all like in their own space. Like the, the wild is around creation. So I guess it's technically in the wild, but like as far as I know, you couldn't really get in a boat and sail on the wild until you bumped into Autochthon. Uh, do you agree with that assessment, Chad? 
Yes, I, I do. <laughs> and I would say that they're not even in the wild the same way I would say the underworld is not in the wild. It is met- metaphysically underneath creation uh, right. in the same way that, that Yushan is metaphysically above creation. I, I think the right. difference is that by being in the wild, creation is theoretically boundless. If the elemental poles continue to get pushed outwards, it, creation could expand infinitely. While the domains that are elsewhere, like Atokthania, like Malfi's, like Yushan, are intrinsically limited in size because they are, they are bounded domains. So is creation getting bigger? It can. It can, yeah. It gets uh, that- bigger and smaller. That would, if you, like, make creation bigger could be a game goal. Okay. <laughs> so, like, so there are times when creation needs its stretch genes, and there are other times where maybe it's trying to get ready for, like, summer or something like that. Okay, got it. Yeah, in fact, there's a, there's a whole power set based on building new land out of the edges of creation into the wild. So it's definitely a thing that can happen. Oh, God. So there's like SimCity built into this game? That's ridiculous. Are there any archetypal settings that don't exist somewhere in creation? I mean, well, besides the other realms, besides the extra dimensions, like Malfius. Yeah, or... yeah. Besides the answer. If, if I think of like all the types of fantasy, uh, right. is, there, is there anything that the creation doesn't seemingly have somewhere in it? No. <laughs> yeah, kind of Euro fantasy kingdoms um, are, are probably the one that is the least represented, uh, but you can make room for that in the Hundred Kingdoms, as we mentioned earlier. Otherwise, creation should be diverse enough to represent about any kind of real world culture through a fantasy lens somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the mostly what Exalted doesn't, openly encourage you to do is to make places that are sort of European Renaissance or medieval feudalism inspired, but like making up a place that's strongly inspired by Florence or Venice in the 1400s and just slapping that like in the hundred kingdoms on a river somewhere would really not be out of place. Skullstone kind of operates like uh, Venice in some ways as well. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of places to go, all right, I'm really inspired by this real world thing. It's maybe not 100% in line with Exalted's maybe slightly more Eastern flavor, but there's room for it if you look on the map. It's massive. Yeah. Rather than describing Exalted as Eastern, I like to describe it as non-Western. Non-Western, yeah. Because uh, it doesn't just draw on, say, Chinese and and Indian and Japanese influences. Uh, They're definitely a predominant aspect of it. But there's also a lot of flavor from the Middle East, from the ancient world, from Mesoamerica, from Africa. And, and that's one of the strengths of Exalted in, in terms of what creation offers. Yeah, I, I said that and I totally agree. And I even wrote a whole thing on like names where like I like Googled the names of like West African languages <laughs> so that I didn't look like an asshole when I was trying to think of like names of places you could ins- be inspired to draw your name from. So yes, it's, it's just non-Western. We're looking away from a more Tolkien-esque type fantasy. There isn't really room for, like, elves and dwarves, to put it that way. And my last question is, so what are we talking about next time? Next time we'll be talking about the Solar Exalted. Yeah, my favorite. So, Monica, where can people find you on the vast wastes of the internet? If people want to follow me on the internet, I am on Twitter, at Zenith Sun. If you want to follow my main podcast where I talk about game design with a good friend of mine, you can go listen to Bonus Experience. That's at bxpcast.com or at bonusexpcast on Twitter. What about you? Where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter as at StoryToldChaz because I am one of the hosts of the Story Told RPG podcast, uh, where we talk about many things, including Exalted, and have the excellent Fall of Giara actual play if you want to see us slowly get through a dragon-blooded game over the course of many sessions. Sweet. Thank you for listening to Systematic Understanding of Everything, an Exalted podcast. Go to exaltcast.com to subscribe, see our show notes, or listen to our past episodes. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and Anchor.fm. If you have a question, shoot us an email at questions at exaltcast.com. If you'd like to support our show, 
please consider using the affiliate links in our show notes to make purchases on DriveThruRPG and the StorytellerVault.com. The opening theme is Return of the Solar Exalted, and the closing theme is the Sidereal Exalted Lesser But Safe from Fanfare for the Chosen by James Simple and is used with permission. In the meantime, exalt strong.